It's been a pleasure to be with you. We've been looking at Matthew chapter 28 together, the Great Commission. We've seen that those on mission are a broken group mended by grace. There were 12 and now there's 11. We've seen that those on mission seek the direction of Jesus as a community together. They sought the Lord's direction. We've seen that those on mission are worshipers. And that some of those on mission doubt. And now we see that it's to all the nations that those on mission will go. What a surprise it must have been for these 11 Jewish students of Jesus. It must have surprised them when he first told them he'd make them fishers of men. And then immediately... He takes them and shows God's mercy to the Decapolis and Syrians, the cities of the Gentiles and of Syrians. It must have shocked them the first time they heard Jesus say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believed in him, because they would have expected the Messiah who was promised to say, God so loved the Jews. It must have startled them When Jesus took them into Samaria and sat by a woman, a Samaritan by a well, it must have shocked them when Jesus began telling stories and the hero of his stories weren't Jewish, but Samaritans. And it must have been difficult to identify with Jesus publicly because eventually his critics began calling him a Samaritan which was to say from fellow Jews, a sellout. It must have bewildered them when Jesus showed mercy to a Roman soldier, not just an unclean Gentile, but the very representative of the cruelty and oppression perpetrated on the Jewish people. And now here, they hear it again. You will go to the nations. He makes it plain. The promises of Abraham that God intends to be a blessing to the nations is now being sealed in Christ Jesus. What a difficult thing it was for these original students of Jesus to look at people of differing ethnicities than their own and to see the image and dignity of God in them. It would take Peter as one example, a very long time. This aspect of Peter's discipleship was difficult for him. Peter will not step foot in a Gentile's house until Acts chapter 10. It will take three years with Jesus. It will take the crucifixion It will take the rooster crow. It will take the resurrection. It will take the restoration of Jesus. It will take Pentecost. It will take a vision from God and a confrontation from another apostle until finally Peter will call an ethnicity other than his own clean before God because of Christ Jesus. I believe of all the aspects of this mission that Jesus calls to, this one is perhaps the most difficult for most of us. I once visited Israel and my Israeli tour guide Hearing that I was a pastor, let me know that he too was a praying man. He told me his prayer. He said, every morning I pray this. I pray, I thank you, God, that I am not a Gentile. I thank you, God, that I am not a slave. I thank you, God, that I am not a woman. It troubled me. I'd never heard that before. And so I researched it. That's what scholars do. 
And it turns out this prayer has ancient roots in Judaism, but not only Judaism. Also in the Greco-Roman world, the Greeks had their own version of this prayer. This is the norm of the human heart. Our ethnicity, our own nation. I'm an American speaking to you. My nation, who I love. We believe ourselves superior. <laughs> but we are not alone. Saul of Tarsus felt this way too. He would not greet a Gentile as clean or honorable, so much so that in the name of God, Saul would take up physical force. I'm going to ask you to consider something. Most of us are adults here. You can disagree with me. Consider it though. Isn't it true that each of Jesus' original disciples were nationalists tempted to zealotry? Isn't it true? The first question Peter, James, or John would ask you if they met you was, where are you from? And depending on how you answered that question, without any further questions asked, they would determine if you were their inferior and to what degree. If you were clean or unclean, simply on the basis of being Jewish or not. Tempted to zealotry. When James and John encounter an ethnicity different than their own, acting disagreeably toward Jesus, even though they've been in class with Jesus, even though they've been apprenticed by Jesus, even though they've been taught by Jesus that the sum of the law is love for God with all our heart, mind, and soul and strength, and out of that love for God to love our neighbor, no matter who that neighbor is, as ourself, including our enemy, even though this is their training, their reaction comes from a deeper training, a cultural one, an ethnic one. Shall we call down fire from heaven and kill these Samaritans, Lord? They are tempted to terrorism. They are tempted to militia movement in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, no less but really rooted in their own ethnic sense of superiority and hatred for ethnicities different than their own. When Peter pulls out a sword to hack off a man's ear, he is tempted to zealotry, to take up arms in the name of God, yes, but more so in the name of Jesus. But something happened. The Apostle Paul, certainly true, tempted to nationalism in our words today, and a zealot, not just tempted to it, a practicer of zealotry. And yet, though every original disciple was a nationalist prone to zealotry. None of them could stay that way. Not with Jesus. And so you come to familiar words in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, and perhaps, perhaps you have not seen it, perhaps some of you have, but the Apostle Paul, changed by the grace of Jesus Christ, stands up as a Jewish man and says what his own people would hate 
and what the Romans would hate. He stands up and directly opposes this ancient prayer. My guide said, I thank you, God, that I'm not a Gentile. The Apostle Paul declares, there is neither Jew nor Greek. My guide prayed, I thank you, God, that I am not a slave. But Paul declares, there is neither slave nor free. My guide prayed, I thank you, God, that I'm not a woman. But Paul declares, there is neither male nor female. He directly opposes the common prayer of the Jewish and Greco-Roman world. A changed man. Oh, make no mistake, Paul loves his own people and his own country. He tells us that the history, the covenants, the patriarchs, all of them belong to his own people. He would rather die, he says, than for his own people not to know the things of Christ. And yet that same man who loves his own people, gives his entire, the entirety of the rest of his adult life to non-Jewish people. He becomes, by the grace of God, the apostle to the Gentiles. Consider the ethnic humility the Apostle Paul had to learn from Jesus in order to care about a person like me and like most of you. Dear friend, if you are called to mission, and you are, whether to stay home or to go, one of the toughest aspects of your discipleship with Jesus is this very thing. He will teach you to love your own people, but to recognize that your nation and mine will bow along with every nation before a different king and a different kingdom superior in every way to my nation and to yours, to my leaders and to yours. So the Apostle Paul says, we no longer look at human beings according to the flesh, but as they are in Christ Jesus. And this is why the Apostle Paul finds himself with one of his best friends being a Greek, Titus. When Paul was in the throes of depression and in discouragement, it wasn't a Jewish man who came to bring the comfort of God to Paul. It was a Greek man, Titus. And when Paul and Barnabas are set apart... Paul, Paul is in a worship service younger Paul could never have imagined. He, in Acts chapter 13, he is in a worship service with Jewish people and Greek people in Antioch of all places, even with brothers from Africa there. And God speaks through that community. What a bizarre community that was. Their own ethnicities in terms of pride being broken down and seeing themselves as brothers and sisters in Christ. This is a difficult business. If it took even the Apostle Peter until Acts chapter 10, it may take a while for you and me and those we love. And yet it is a necessary business. Because the commission from Jesus is to go into the nations. And after all, isn't this good news? <laughs> How else was it that your nation and mine should ever know anything of Jesus? But that he humbles himself and crosses cultures and comes to where we are in the world if you speak like this, 
Some might call you a sellout. If you speak like this, some might think you don't care about your own people. If you speak like this, it might cost you. But this is the way Jesus speaks. And anyone who follows him comes to learn it. And why should it matter? Not only because this is our Lord, but with our Lord, this is our future. Revelation chapter 7. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Heaven will be full of people who do not look like you, smell like you, eat the foods you eat, wear the clothes you wear. So best get used to it now. Revelation 21, and I saw no temple in that heavenly city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earthly will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. When Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him might not perish, Jesus showed us God's love for the nations, that no one is excluded. All of us are on equal ground. Anyone from any nation, anywhere who believes on Jesus will not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen and amen.